Hey, listen up. Yeah, we here and we locked in. Let's keep it going all the way to the top 10. We feel the turtle, so it's no other option. Fred and Ryan, just watch them. Let's take it to the max. It's the shell and tell. They come with all the facts. It's the shell and tell. Let's take it to the max. It's the shell and tell. They come with all the facts. It's the shell and tell. What's up, Turf fans? Welcome back to yet another episode of the Shell and Tell podcast. It's Wednesday, October 12th. And on this week's show, man, we're going to try to digest a tough, tough loss to Purdue over the weekend. A game we felt we would have, could have, should have had, but fell short. Yeah, no matter how I feel about the refs, we got to look forward to another Big Ten road trip and see if we can get back on track and see if we can play just one team this week. (laughs) Yeah, that's the goal. Exactly. And with Maryland, obviously, six games into the season now, six more to go. We take a look at how Maryland's fared at the midseason point of the season. Before we start this week's shows, today's episode is sponsored by Inside the Black and Gold. Inside the Black and Gold is your trusted source for the latest news and buzz around all Maryland athletics with deep dives into the recruiting world for our revenue programs. Are you looking for the healthiest Maryland forums on the net? Look no further than Inside the Black and Gold. Founder and lead writer Ahmed Gafir, formerly of 247 and Sports Illustrated, in my opinion, has been the top fo- Maryland football source for many years now. And with the new site and team of writers, it makes IBG arguably the lead source for every program at College Park. Make sure if you're a Maryland sports fan, you have an IBG subscription and be sure to tell all your Terp fans about it as well. To get a deeper look at IBG recruiting news, be sure to watch Inside the Bag with Ahmed and Mason Viner of Young Terps on YouTube as well. All right, fellas, we got to talk about this. Like I said, another heartbreaking loss, 31-29 to Purdue on Saturday in front of a nice showing, I thought, by fans and students down at CQ. Took a little bit of time for the students to, to kind of mingle in and fill up there, but uh, we'll start with that before we get into the game. I thought that the, the showing, the game presentation, everything was good. It was definitely a late-arriving crowd overall. Um, yeah. the, the students, the biggest props I'm going to give, let me start with the positive. The students that come to the game this year seem to stay. The yeah. vast majority of them, which is a like marked improvement over the last decade or more of students. So please love all you guys. But I, the people are kind of propping up the student section a little more than they deserve because I don't think everyone realizes how far the student section stretches. There is... <laughs> There, there are two sections to the right of the band, like the band section and another section to the right. So the flag drop sections have been packed. They look great. And if that was our whole student section, they're doing amazing. And the ones that come are staying, but there definitely are a lot more student seats that need to be filled. Those other two sections look about as at least as sparse as the rest of the stadium where the fans need to still step it up a notch. Um, but yes, the ones that are there a million times more involved engaged till the end there's a lot of of years where it doesn't matter what the score is how competitive is by third quarter everybody's gone and that's not happening what did you see in this game Ahmed with the fan support yeah uh well I noticed actually a kickoff I mean the the kickoff crowd looked very sparse and um and I'll 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 give the student section I think the last two years like last season as well that it kind of stuck out to me that they've been doing a better job of you know kind of coming out to the games and whatnot um so I think you know they're doing a good job but uh I could tell that you know from the press box I could see you know a lot large group of people that were still waiting to get into the stadium um so I felt like once everyone was able to get in everyone you know finished tailgating whatnot uh it filled up pretty good and it looked pretty good um so I thought it was probably the best showing uh for Maryland all year um so i thought it was you know again you know kind of step in the right direction it's unfortunate that they that they lost with that type of crowd but um it's it's been gradually getting better yeah i'll say um first i'll take it take take the 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 l i did i did miss kickoff for the first time in a very long time <laughs> we missed kickoff. i was yeah i was one of the people standing outside waiting that you saw there um but just from the beginning in the parking lot what me and Fred noticed because you know we're two giant guys with two goofy hats in there before <laughs> lots and lots of people were stopping us and asking us for directions on the way to you know what is the stadium down this way is the stadium over here and i was just like i looked at fred eventually after like the third or fourth one and i'm like 
hey, you know what I learned from this? There's a lot of new fans here. This is really good. I hope every week I'm getting asked questions about where what's going on because every week before that it seemed, you know, the same people were showing up. Everyone knew it was old hat type stuff, and there were definitely a bunch of new fans out there, and security was getting overwhelmed. <laughs> there were plenty of people there at kickoff probably in line that didn't that didn't make kickoff. Uh, I, I got a notification on the Terrapin Thunderdome that we're in the little group chat that said, looks like garbage on TV. And I was <laughs> I, I took a selfie with like this mass of people behind me, and I'm like, everyone's at security. Give it a minute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, all the new fans that came in to support uh, were treated to an entertaining game. Uh, if you were Terp fans, obviously you left disappointed. Uh, did they play perfect? No. Uh, did they give themselves a chance to win? Yes. Did they shoot themselves in the foot along the way? Multiple times. <laughs> were they only playing against Purdue? Absolutely not in this game. So there's there's many reasons that this team, uh, and many ways that this team could have, would have, and should have won this game. Uh, but let's start with uh, QB1. Let's look at Leah because I thought Leah had a, a pretty good game in this game. 26 to 38, 315 yards, three touchdowns, did have the one pick. He also ran for a touchdown to open up the game. Uh, but I thought Leah looked good and looked sharp in this game. Yeah, I thought he definitely did as well. Um, there were a couple of, couple of throws that he had. I believe there was one on the third and 18. I believe it was in the second quarter. Uh, he tried hitting uh, 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 Rakeem Jarrett on a uh, – deep ball and he was about two three yards short um and there were a couple of uh, long throws maybe 15 20 yards downfield that he was a little bit short on um and those are the only times where i kind of thought you know maybe you know how, how injured is he and how much is that kind of affecting him um you know making those kind of throws but uh, overall you know still an efficient day despite you know had that one interception but um you know i, I think i think he's doing a good job so far yeah, it was definitely the deep ball that was a problem. The the intermediate passing game still looked very good, very sharp. Yeah, at one point, I was just like, Fred, we no more throws over 20 yards. There's just no point. <laughs> like, we're, we're doing just fine dinking and dunking well, and picking these guys apart. Just as you say that, <laughs> then he hits Deitches on a 68-yard touchdown pass, which was a big pass. Now, granted, at first, from the field, before you went back and actually watched it, it did look like the ball was underthrown and it was a bad throw, which it was, but there was reason for it. He was forced yeah. to step up in the pocket. His feet weren't set. He didn't get a whole lot behind it. So there's a reason that he was throwing, but he had him so wide open that he was that able was to make up throw, for that. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, he uh, had to hit him then because they would have recovered otherwise. And Deitch just made it, made it at 68 yards. Uh, two, two weeks in a row at the 68 yards, he drug people for the last 15 into the end zone. Kind of yeah. like uh, Littleton with his two stiff arms to get 68 yards last yeah. week. Yeah. Yeah, that was a hell of a run by uh, by Deitches, especially just kind of going in right before the halftime uh, to Needed tie the game it. at 17. Yeah, I mean, I thought that was a huge kind of momentum to play for Maryland. So uh, ended up obviously being a, a huge piece in the game. Yeah, I mean, he came up big in this game. Four catches, 106 yards, two touchdowns. So a big coming out party for Deitches in this game. Uh, the one thing on the offense really that was extremely disappointing, they just could not get the run game going no matter what they did. Uh, we talked about, you know, early on in this year, what we were seeing that was different with this run game is we were seeing the explosive plays, the big plays. Last week, we saw it, like you mentioned, with the 60-yard run with uh, with, with um, Littleton. Littleton. Littleton, right. We didn't have any of that in this game. You had Hemby with seven carries for 26 yards, a little under three yards a carry. Uh, Littleton, six, catch, or six attempts for 30 yards, a five-yard per carry. McDonald five uh, five attempts for 19 yards and 3.8 yards per carry just missing that explosive play yeah it did we did get a little bit of action out of Hemby he had a uh, five reception for 63 yards in the through the air just right. couldn't get it done on the ground uh, and TD through the air as well yeah uh, I thought that you know the running backs I wrote about uh the, the running backs room kind of being you know uh, a bright spot for this offense just this season you know being able to generate 300 yard uh, rusher so far through the first six games but um you know you need the explosive plays out of that front game to kind of complement uh what should be in a lethal and explosive passing attack and like you guys said you know it just wasn't there and uh Hemby uh he ended up you know, like you guys mentioned you know he played a and in the passing game, and I noticed today when I was writing about him, uh, he's actually caught uh, all 20 targets that have come his way this season, sits third on the team uh, in receptions, which is not something that uh, I think many of us expected kind of coming into the season. Yeah, I know Ryan and I have had discussions as to who the lead back should be. Should it be Hemby? Should it be Littleton? And 
I think that really just kind of depends on the matchup, right? And what your game plan for that upcoming matchup is because Hemby really has developed himself to be a multi threat out of the backfield. He can run the ball. He can catch the ball. He's got explosive speed. We all know the kind of power and authority that Littleton runs with. He's just not quite the receiver of the football out of the backfield. So I think that's just going to depend. I mean, you might see Hemby get the ball more and you might see them like in this game where they went balanced with three different running backs, all with five carries or more. So it's really just going to be, I think, in a game plan situational um, spot. Yeah, yeah, and the running backs aren't the only part of the of the running game. I mean, the offensive line just really was not opening anything right. for them. I w- was sitting there with Fred in the stands just going, this is not the game that I would have picked our offensive line to be outmatched in. Like, if it happened last week with their against Michigan State with their, like, uh, defensive end that was highly touted coming in, I would have been like, oh, well, that really sucks. We're right back where we started. But once we just kind of erased them and did it did fine versus their defensive line. I wasn't expecting it from these guys. I really wasn't, but they, they were able to manhandle our offensive line, which really hurt these running backs. Yeah. yeah I thought, I thought so yeah. too. Uh, you know, like you guys said, you know, it was a little bit disappointing and I think just kind of the offensive line as a whole, um, you know, kind of hasn't really lived up to the, the billing so far this year. Uh, but um, yeah, uh, like you guys said, you know, I thought, I think in both sides of the field, you know, I didn't think the, the defensive line, the front seven was going to be able to generate as much as they did. And I didn't think the offensive line was going to struggle that the way they did. Um, Talia, I thought did a good job kind of using his mobility at times, but um, you know, definitely, definitely feels like there's another level that this offensive line can kind of get to, to, to help that offense, you know, maximize its efficiency. Right. Well, you you talked a minute ago about this offense and how explosive it can be at times and, you know, high powered passing game and that kind of thing. And you look at this, you know, like I said, Lee had 315 yards through the air uh, and three touchdowns. I think the the biggest disappointment in all of that, though, is the defense finally has a big game, gets you three turnovers, but yet you get zero points out of those turnovers. That can't happen as an offense. I really can't. It was very disappointing to see over and over again. We were like, like hands in our, our heads in our hands, just like, oh, we gave it away again. And the defense would step back up and, and hand it right back. It's like, oh, we got it. Uh, how many times can you do that? This high power offense cannot be stifled that way. This is probably the best defensive performance you're going to have all year. And we wasted it. Yeah. And honestly, I mean, I think, you know, for, we, coming into the season i mean for maryland's run seven to really be dynamic and and you know um you know be able to generate that pressure they needed something from Daryl Chami, and i think that's kind of been the x factor for you know this defense kind of coming into the season and like you guys mentioned for him to be able to generate two three tackles for loss two sacks uh fumble recovery um and then to generate three turnovers in the third quarter um you know i, I think that wasn't something again that we kind of expected this offense to kind of be able to struggle moving the football. Um, and I feel like the, the play calling, the play designs at times have been kind of peculiar. Um, and I think there were a couple in that, I believe it was the third and 10 um, after the second turnover. Um, it was just kind of, you know, just did not look very well executed. Um, but yeah, I mean, Loxley, you know, he was one of the first things he talked about for his defense to be able to, to, to have that ga- kind of game. Uh, especially, you know, for that to be the season high, five sacks against a Purdue team. Um, and then obviously you have Indiana this weekend. So I think, you know, being able to continue to generate that pressure and then obviously have the offense, um, they'll, they'll have an opportunity this weekend, uh, most likely, to show that, hey, you know, we're, we're kind of able to, to turn the points because um, it kind of felt like every single time Maryland was able to generate a turnover and then, you know, three and out or they had to punt the football uh, or they won fourth on fourth down and they didn't get it. It kind of felt like that was when the energy started to slip out of the stadium a little bit. Absolutely. I know it slipped from our section because it was disappointing every time it happened. You had the force fumble, like you mentioned, by Nishami, and, the, and he recovers that. You had the interception on the tip pass by Charlie Jones that Ja'Cory and Bennett came up with, and then the the, the fumble and recovery by Jayshon Barham. Uh, what you got on the Purdue 42 and can't move the ball, you end up going with a 52-yard field goal attempt that was missed. It's just... You know, we talked about the Michigan game and and how that game could have been different. And and one play, you know, one defensive play or turnover and the offense taking the ball down the field and scoring points and how how different that could have been. Well, here your defense gives you the opportunity three different times to make this a game that shouldn't have been close and you can't capitalize. 
Yeah, it, it really feels like one that went away. I mean, without the unbelievable turnovers, just the dominance of only allowing 40 rushing yards total. Yeah. Only 15 when you take out the negative yardage for the quarterback that they do in, in college. 15 yards you gave up on the ground. How do you lose that game? How do you lose a game where you get five turnovers and allow 15 yards on the ground? It really is mind-blowing. Well, there's a lot of ways you lose that game, and – we're going to dive into it. Why not? Because that's kind of <laughs> what not? we do. That's our thing, right? What else you got to do on a Wednesday night? <laughs> uh, well, one of the things that uh, in this game, I guess at least some of them were debatable, but we talked about uh, shooting yourself in the foot, and that's penalties, right? Another problem in this game. I said before, I think if you're in that realm of five to six penalties a game, that's what's expected. That's normal. That's what most teams do. But here they are again, nine penalties, 75 yards, Refs or not, you can't have that continue to be an issue, especially in Big Ten play. Yeah, I mean, Maryland leads the Big Ten in penalties per game, or penalty total penalties, penalty yards. I think they're tied 124th nationally with Syracuse uh, for the most penalties in the country. Um, I mean, it's been it's been a problem this year, uh, and it's also been a problem under Loxley, you know, all four years, you know, the discipline, the self-inflicted wounds. I mean, this isn't the first time we've talked about it, um, and especially when you're you, you have these swing games, uh, you just you you can't have it. And then you kind of look back, and Michigan, so far, is kind of looking like the anomaly when Maryland only had one turnover. Uh, right. And obviously, I mean, you know, in a game like that, the margin of error is so slim, and you know, they they the the lack of self inflicted wounds. To, it's already used a Loxley cliche, but um, that is what helped Maryland stay in the game for. Hundred percent entirety. Um, so it's it's very frustrating. Um, I mean, I think this year, fifty penalties so far. Uh, Twenty two have been from the offensive line. So uh, it's been yeah. it's a little little bit concerning, especially when all five of those guys are coming back. Yeah, you expect more from your senior leadership, and that's you know the senior leadership of Purdue is what hurt us. Like you know, I, I talked in my one man show last week, like. You are not going to be outmatched on talent. You are going to be outmatched on like experience, age, you know, maybe discipline because of their everyone on their field was a senior almost. Um, but you were not going to be outmatched on talent. And we let the lesser team win. We really did. I, 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 we win that game seven to eight times out of 10. We, it's, it's, yeah. it's really one you want back. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I know another issue we've talked about in the past is, not letting that one guy beat you. And uh, now this was a combination of a quarterback playing very well, making very good throws. He was much better than I thought he was going to be. Their tight end, Payne Durham, I mean, played out of his absolute mind in this game. Uh, always found the soft spot in her zone. Went for seven catches for 109 yards and the one touchdown, including the big 56 yarder that he just carried a defender or two uh, yeah. to get them in position for the go ahead touchdown late in the fourth quarter. Uh, it, it, this just goes to show it, it. We've been beaten by wide receivers, a single wide receiver in the past. We've been beaten by a running back and now we've been beaten by a tight end. There's no bias, man. It's just finding the guy and eliminating that guy. But we just struggle with that. Yeah, but I think I think the you know the alternative is if it wasn't going to be Payne Durham, it was going to be Charlie Jones, and Charlie Jones coming into the game uh, led the Big Ten in catches, receiving yards, and touchdowns. Um, and I thought Maryland a did point. a good job against him. You know, they were obviously you know Purdue just tried to find ways to get him the ball quickly and and you know let him do do his thing in space. Um, but I think the concerning thing about Durham and his game, uh, especially on that first play when Purdue took over. Um, was just that he was wide open. I mean, he, he was continuously just kind of sitting in the soft spots of Maryland's defense, and that was how he was able to kind of move the move the ball and just you know uh, uh, be a factor the way he was. Um, and I thought it was really disappointing. Loxy talked about it. it was just uh, missed assignment on that last play. I believe they cover, they ca- called a cover zero and uh, just a miscommunication, and that's what led to that breakdown. But um, yeah, I, I think I think it was uh, definitely disappointing. Like you said, you know, just to have that. Um, have that be the the biggest killer. Um, and then I saw after the game, he tweeted, you know, Merrill never offered me for lacrosse. And I'm thinking to myself, you're playing football. What the hell does a lacrosse scholarship have to do with anything? But uh, <laughs> hey, whatever, whatever got uh, him going that day. Yeah, yeah. right. All right. <laughs> another, another, what is it? 
Ben Dixon or whatever the, from Michigan guy. <laughs> Maryland never all for me for basketball. What was that guy's name? Oh, Hunter, Hunter Little Dick Dickson. Dick. Hunter Dickinson, that's him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Little Dick Dick. Oh man. <laughs> well, I mentioned oh. it a couple minutes ago. Uh their quarterback, Aiden O'Connell. Uh, looked really good in this game. I mean, it, again, he didn't get too hyper focused on any one guy, even though Payne Durham was his go to in this guy in this game. He was able to spread the ball around to ten different receivers. Uh, his accuracy unreal in this game, seventy three percent. And and like you and I discussed, Ryan, it, it, a lot of those incomplete passes weren't bad passes. They were him scrambling out of the pocket and just getting rid of the ball, being smart. Yeah, it was not hard to make this guy throw the ball away. You got him moving off his spot, and he took maybe four steps looking downfield, and then he was finding a spot to throw it on the bench. Um, and I thought that was going to help us. I really thought it was going to work that way. But it just turned out that he was so confident that he could come back and convert a 15-yard play the next one that he was living to you know fight another day. I, I truly believe that he beat us more than, you know, Payne Durham. I mean, like we said, he was open on all of these plays. He was not, yeah. he wasn't making miracle catches. He wasn't grabbing, you know, dunking on people. Yes. That long run. Did he drag people like 20 yards, but really that was more the defense was like, Oh, we're screwed. If they score, let's just tackle the ball when they're all half the size of this tight end. You're not getting the ball. You're not going to take it from this man. Uh, so it was just bad decision. Um, but yes, this quarterback, I did not give him enough credit. Uh, he, you know, he does not have the offensive weapons outside of Charlie Jones, like you discussed, to be flashy. But him himself is hyper accurate, stupid good. He, like Locke said, he could play on Sundays because this is he is like a prototypical like backup quarterback. Like he's he's going to be a game manager. He is not going to give the ball to the other team. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he he definitely threw some good pass, especially that fade that he had in the back corner of the end zone was a great pass, but your completion percentage can go up pretty easily when you've got given you're, you're basically given the flats, you're given the soft spots in the zone. I mean, he does, you know, there's no defense for it, at least running a cover three, they need to switch that up and go cover two and cover the flats because that was a problem all game long. And it made yeah. an easy target for him to pick it apart. Yep. So, yeah. all right, well, let's talk about a couple of the, uh, the big plays in this game. Um, I mean, obviously, there was also an issue with the missed field goal. That was a, a three points that were left on the board. But I'm not going to fret too hard on that. It was a 52-yard attempt that, I mean, just went right. He could have made that from 62 as, much, as deep as that ball went, but it just went wide left on it. Uh, but, again, that is three points that you miss out on. And that was his first true miss because the miss last week was on a bad snap that slowed down the exchange and threw off his timing on his kick that broke his streak. This was a good snap, good hold, pushed it right. Yeah. Um, so that was definitely his first miss. And, of course, followed it up later in the game with getting it blocked. So Yeah, you know. <laughs> so let's talk about that because it's the block that, in my opinion, shouldn't have been. Uh, and if it, it felt like that even in the stadium, not just watching the replays afterwards because – I mean, I couldn't see the snap, but I could very clearly see the defender. His entire torso was across the line of scrimmage before the ball cleared the center. So his again, torso I, was behind the, the, the end line before exactly. anyone moved. Anyone moved like not, not another defender, not another offensive player. No one had moved and his whole body is in the backfield. Right. I, now I've yeah. seen some I've seen some slowed down footage, um, and it hyper is hyper slowed down. Hyper slowed down. It is pretty bang bang. But I wanted to get Ahmed's take because we haven't had a chance to talk about this. What was your thought on the blocked extra point? Was was he offsides? Was he not? I mean, live it definitely looked like it. Uh, it's kind of hard to see. And I, again, I see the you know the slow down. Um, I still think I saw a clip on Twitter of uh, just the play slowed down like that. Um, and I saw the argument that you know the snap was slow, whatnot. Um, I thought it definitely would have been, and you know, I think in ninety nine percent of occurrences in, you know, NFL and college games, that that's getting hauled. Uh, I was because I thought, no one moves. If you're the only one yeah. moving, it's it's a problem. No matter it's offense or defense. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just kind of, and I think I think the part that's kind of hard for me to swallow, and I I, I think it kind of irritates me when Maryland fans are like, oh, that's the reason they lost. Obviously, it was huge play. Huge. Uh, huge it's a part play. of it. Not the I mean, reason, exactly. but it's a part it's of it. It's the reason we couldn't exactly. make a comeback. It's exactly. not the reason that we lost. We, we could have won the game way earlier, but it's the reason that we couldn't make our comeback. That Correct. That is 100% valid. I mean, it, it made a concrete 
uh, change in how the game was going to be played. I mean, it wasn't like uh, it was kind of in line with the Talia interceptions, you know, just with those not being interceptions and then him not even getting the respect of or Merrill not even getting the respect of review. Um, and I should know. I don't know off the top of my head if that if, um, if they didn't call an offside, if they're even able to, to review that after the fact. I don't think that they would be able to, but I, I, I definitely thought that live it, it was. Um, I continue to think so. You've been seeing. The big board uh, certainly did. They played it yeah. 400 times. Yeah. yeah. It was the I, best I, thing the board's done all year. I mean, even <laughs> even even when you want to slow down like that, I mean, you can make the argument that I um, I guess not, but I feel like even when you slow it down, I mean, again, 99% of the time, that that's getting called yeah. in a football yeah. game. Um and I, I think just for, you know, this to be a third straight week where there's some, you know, questionable calls, uh, that that's kind of what sticks out to me about it. And even I can't think of the guy's name, but even the guy that did block it knew that he was off size because he's being a complete jackass about it on the sideline, talking up to the fans and whatnot, pointing to his head like he was smart, just being a complete yeah. douchebag about it. He but. was in the bench 10 feet away from me, and I, I think a younger Ryan would have thrown stuff at him and maybe got <laughs> kicked out of the stadium. No, younger Ahmed would have done the same, so it's all good. Man. <laughs> right. But, I mean, that left the Terps with a six-point lead at that point. It was 23-17. to 17. They had 7.45 to go in the game. Like I said earlier, Purdue then drives down the field. They use their tight end. They get down to the position with like two minutes left. They end up scoring the touchdown to take the lead uh, and then kick the extra point, which puts them up by eight. the eight. Uh, so now here we are. Doom and minute, gloom. Minute and 45. It's doom and gloom. The one point's like the deciding factor in the game. How do we let this happen? How do we let the refs let this happen? We're, you know, everything. Everybody's depressed. Kayla's yeah. doing our usual pacing. Why do we come here every week? I, right. We always lose. <laughs> <laughs> and in my mind, you know, it's, I, I wanted, I hadn't seen yet Leah. And I want to give credit to, to Leah because it's due. Uh, I hadn't seen him when the moment was big come through the way he did in this game and in a minute and 40 seconds led the team down and put them in position to potentially tie this game. Uh, I, I think it's, you have to give Leah credit for that because to be able to do that um, on top of dealing with all those emotions, right. And knowing how this game is kind of unfolded, being able to compartmentalize that, put that to the side and go out there and get the job, job done, one time. He did it. He did he it, did. and even on the two-point conversion, he was able to do that. Yeah, the only other time was the Illinois was was Illinois on the road was the only other time yeah. that we saw that from him. Um, right. In person, this was the only time we got to watch it for sure. Yeah, right. I, I actually think exactly that, um, and I should have included it. I think I, think I did in my midseason uh, article today. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, I thought that was really impressive. Obviously, you know, it was pretty obvious what Maryland was going to come out doing, and uh, I thought he did a good job just kind of commanding – uh, control of the offense and uh it was pretty effortless drive down the field it was for sure it was fun to live man we drove down that field building the excitement building the excitement building the excitement score a touchdown and everybody kind of celebrates a little bit but knowing we still have a big problem we have a two-point conversion so it was like this yay oh, man but I had and Ohio then, State vibes when we got to that point where he needed the two-point conversion to, yes. to win the game. I had those vibes going. I was like, I'm not saying anything. I don't want to speak this out loud. And then we get it. We score a two-point conversion. We the are losing our mind. Goes Everyone. bananas. There is no one saw a flag anywhere in that stadium. Every human being on with a Maryland jersey on was celebrating, and every human being without a Maryland jersey on was pouting. No Ryan's one recording saw a, flag. a video to we, put on Twitter yes, at the time. We are called recording a video talking shit to the right. If you have not seen it, please find our Twitter or Facebook accounts and go see this moment. The moment where these two Maryland fans got to live the ultimate reality that we were going to overtime and we're clearly going to dominate by the by the and pure swing of that momentum. And I just went ahead I, after we after we uh, had our depressing moment and we're told that you didn't score shit and we missed it. I'm like, Fred, I have to post it. Everyone has to see this like it. To, there's the full adrenaline loss just. It made it hurt so much more. It made it hurt so much more yeah. than if that never happened. So, <laughs> obviously, again, in the moment, uh, they get flagged for a legal man down the field. Um, in the moment, that's a call that I think you can't make 
in a game changing <laughs> situation like that, in a game deciding situation, every other play, play. It, every it play. does. It happens every play, right? And I and I had that exact Just same like thought. Holding. But they weren't showing it up on the on the jumbotron. They didn't show anything on the replays for it. So I didn't really see it until I was able to get home. And uh, I somebody had posted the all twenty two of it, and you can see. I mean, he's clearly four yards down beyond the the line of scrimmage in the end zone. So he was downfield. Uh, so is the flag justified? Yes, in the sense that he, you know, by the book, <laughs> he was illegally downfield. But like you said, ninety eight percent of the time the that is yeah. not called. 98% of the time it's not called, and he did not throw the flag until the pass was completed and the play was over. You throw yeah. flags when the penalties happen, right? When you see the penalty, you throw it. The pass was completed. It The, the comeback had been finished. We were now going to overtime or have to defend for 30 seconds or whatever it was, 35 seconds. To go to overtime. Well, and to then that, he to that drops point, the flag. though, you can't call an illegal downfield until it's committed to being a passing play. Because he can be down the field like that. I hate that like that's that a valid run. point, Fred. I hate that that's true. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Down the field on a run play, he can make that block. But on a passing <sighs> play, you have to wait. So, But Damn even it. still, I didn't see the flag. At any point, I didn't see it. I'm like, Not it must have been laying in the yellow of the end zone because I didn't see it yeah. anywhere. No one I did. I felt like my heart was ripped we out of We didn't know chest. why the refs were talking because the stadium was so loud you couldn't hear what they said. All we saw was we were lined up again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I noticed it as soon as the uh, the pass is completed, um, my immediate thought was, boom, all right, we got to go into overtime. And I'm thinking, all right, like literally for a split second, I'm thinking, damn, everything I just wrote, I just have to rewrite. <laughs> <laughs> it's about to be a new game. Um, and then I saw one or two players like put their head on their helmets. And then I looked in the end zone and I saw the flag and I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I kind of agree with you guys. I mean, um, you know, you, you can call this on every single play. Like Fred, like you Ryan can. said, you can call holding on every single play. Um, I, so in I mean, those moments, how? How do you do yeah. it? I, I, I this agree. Is two, um, this is two different officiating crews because the, the shitty SMU crew was doing the Rutgers-Wisconsin game this week. By the way, they were just as shitty for them. So I don't know. if Maybe it's not a Maryland bias. Maybe our officiating crews are just fucking terrible. Or maybe they hate everyone that joined the Big Ten recently. I don't know which one it is, but they were terrible. I didn't realize it was the same crew. I'm sitting here watching a game. I think it was Friday night or Thursday night, whenever they played. Um, and I'm just, you know, just have threw it on TV in the fourth quarter. And 10 plays in, I'm like, holy shit, these refs blow a whistle on every play. And then my wife walks in the room. She goes, that's that lady from the SMU game. <laughs> so the female <laughs> are like, holy crap, it's the same crew that I bitched about two weeks ago. Like, they, they're, they're addicted to being on television. They're addicted to throwing flags. Your job is to make sure it is a fair game. And it's not to make sure that everything is called. Like, it's just not the thing. Call the egregious calls. Call the things that matter. You're not... Nobody yeah. wants the flow of a game to be broken up with a with a whistle and, every thirty seconds. And that, and that was Loxie's point after the game um, when he talked about the elite this the two point conversion penalty. He said that that penalty had no impact on the play itself. Yeah. The uh, offsides right. had plenty of impact yeah. on a block. Yeah, exactly. And the, and it, the legal downfield had no impact so, on the play. So I, I understand that perspective. Um, and yeah, he he actually hasn't you know mentioned it or brought it up or anything like that. But uh, I'd be curious to see you know kind of what Maryland if. What they did with the Big Ten office, if they, you know, if they did escalate any any of these, so um, yeah. We'll, and we'll I understand, see. I understand in that moment why Locks didn't do it because if Locks ends up with a 15 yard penalty and we lose the game, everyone's gonna blame it on Locks. But at some point, at some point, Locks is gonna have to go full baseball manager, take a 15 yard penalty, be thrown out of the stadium, and take the fine. At some point, it's gotta happen. Yeah. Now, I don't care if it's in the first half of a game so your team can make up for that 15-yard penalty. At some point, you can't just have this happen every week. Well, this was at the I, end of the and, game. Like, there was no reason know, for saying, it to not happen then. You know what I mean? But, There's nothing no, to cost the them problem, other than uh, fine. Yeah, I, I guess the problem there was that you would then be trying a 17-yard two-point conversion a second time. Oh, so there was well, still yeah. a chance okay. to win the game in that moment. Uh, so I, I get why, and even that last drive, but it's just at some point, 
why is it okay for a baseball manager to get thrown out? Never okay for a football coach to get thrown out. I don't know. I don't know which one. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, It's a good point. But all right. Well, listen, again, I'm glad we were able to vocalize our frustrations with all that. But like we said earlier, there were many other ways. There were many other ways that we could have and should have won this game. It shouldn't have come down to a deciding two-point conversion attempt, right? There were multiple other ways that we could have won this game. We could have put it away. Uh, sure, but one again, by fourteen at least. Yeah, it, it is. It is what it is, right? We got. We got to move on. Just like the players got to move on, the team's got to move on. Uh, and this week, it's Indiana. Uh, in Indiana, obviously, when we were going through the schedules, uh, was a team that we checked off as a game that we should win. But listen, you can't take these this team lightly. I mean, these are two teams that always find a way to play each other tough. Uh, and typically they're pretty high scoring games. Maryland's actually three and five versus Indiana since 2014 in their last eight games, one and four historically on the road versus Indiana. So I know that we, this was kind of like a, a layup for us when we were picking this, picking the games off the schedule, but you know, it, it's never an easy matchup against Indiana. It's, it's not, it's this they, It's a down year for them. Um, they haven't really beaten anyone of note. Uh, so you would think that only winning against idaho and western kentucky would would lend well for us but i mean hey, they, they did, didn't they beat illinois too the open a year pretty sure they started the year with a win over illinois they're three yeah. and oh, they played week zero yeah i yeah, forgot right. about the week zero one this is the last five yeah so illinois is a pretty good win i mean the big west is all the same and we just lost to the big west you know nobody knows nobody knows who's gonna win that division nobody knows who's good nobody knows who's bad so that does make it a little bit scarier they only put up 10 points versus michigan uh, they did hang 21 on Nebraska, who just snuck out a win without their head coach. So who knows? You can't take this lightly. You got to do your job, which we did not do last week. You got to play up to your standard, which you did not do last week, or at least the offense did not. I apologize to everyone on defense for these statements because you guys played great. Let's do that every week, please. Yeah, and <laughs> even, again, the chunk yardage that they got in the game really wasn't it wasn't the defense. It was the defensive scheming. It was the play calling. It wasn't the defense itself. I thought the defense played a hell of a game uh, against Purdue, but you got to duplicate that. You know, you, you got to chalk up that loss as a loss, compartmentalize it, move on and focus on Indiana now. Yeah. What's your take on this, Ahmed? Yeah, uh, I think um, and I, I, uh, you definitely can't, you know, uh, automatically assume, you know, any team is a guaranteed win, guaranteed loss or anything like that. Uh, I think that Maryland should definitely win this game now maryland shouldn't have won against purdue but i thought i didn't feel as confident on that people were asking me you know should i bet on maryland i was like i'm not searching that game i wouldn't uh because it can go either way but this game you know like i i would put money on maryland to win this game and i think maryland matches up against them very well um also maryland coming off their season high five sacks against purdue uh indiana does lead the big 10 with i believe it's 19 sacks and they just fired the offensive line coach um, so I think Maryland has an ability to to kind of take advantage of of the the Hoosiers uh, front five. Um, so I think Maryland should win by at least one, maybe two possessions uh, come Saturday. Well, they're favored but, by eleven, I think, right now heading into yep. the game. Yep, favored by eleven, over under at sixty one and a half. So the implied score would be about a twenty four to thirty seven. You know, got to figure out where that half point goes in there somewhere. But that's uh what they're projecting. ESPN has us an eighty percent chance to win. Uh, Vegas has been pretty dead on with everything, but maybe the Michigan game where we played a little bit of our heads. I mean, what what was right on the 20 point mark for, for, uh, SMU, it was right on the, uh, the, you know, everything has been right there. And so there was only a three point game last week where we were, we were favored by three, which meant it could go either way with a home team favored by three. And we kind of saw how that worked. So. I would say we're going to win this week, but you got to go do your job. A win on the road in the Big Ten, like Loxley said, is not something you can count on. You have to go take it. Well, we've talked about over the last few weeks, again, uh, having that one guy that single-handedly beats us. Is there anybody on this roster, uh, one in particular guy, running back, wide receiver, tight end, whatever it may be, that we need to focus on and make sure that uh, he isn't that guy? Um, there's not one particular guy, but their their running backs are actually both both. Um, I actually remember covering them, but uh, two uh, former Power Five bounce backs, uh, Sean Shivers for he's from uh, Auburn, and then Josh Anderson from uh, UNC. So both those guys kind of that one A one one B duo uh, at the backfield, and then they brought in Missouri transfer Connor Connor Bazelik, uh, who's doing a good job this year for him. So um, those are you know. 
pretty much the, the, the main kind of guys to, to kind of know. Um, but it's not like last week where it's, um, you know, you just have the tight end and, and Charlie Jones. Um, but again, you know, I think Maryland's defense, the front seven has kind of been able to show some things. Uh, so I think just kind of being able to force uh, uh, the quarterback out of t- outside the pocket. Um, I'm not sure the Hoosiers have the type of skilled players to, to really match up and, and, and adjust to that. So uh, I think that's kind of what, one of the main keys to victory. Speaking of the front seven for Maryland, uh, because I think they will play a large factor in this game. Like you said, their uh, Indiana's offensive line uh, is a mess, uh, and going through the changes and everything, coaching wise, is going to you know obviously expedite that a little bit as well. Uh, what's the status on Ruben Hippolyte? Uh, any update there with him? Uh, yeah, I mean he so he was able to come back last week, but obviously you know it's uh, so I'd heard. Um, it was limited, initially. very limited. Yeah, he was like he, playing in red it. zones. Yeah, I think he, I think he only played ten snaps. Um, so I think, I mean, I think I expect I posted on the site earlier this week, but I expect him to play a little bit more, be a little more available uh, for Maryland than uh, 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 Greg Rose, who missed last week as well. Uh, I expect him to be able to be available for the team this year, or excuse me, this weekend. Um, so we'll see, you know, I think, you know, Maryland's kind of been able to avoid the season ending injuries, but, you know, there are definitely some guys, you know, Talia, obviously I saw him limping pretty noticeably after last week's game, uh, following his press conference. Um, so, you know, guys are definitely banged up this time of year. Uh, so, so, you know, by weeks, two weeks away, but, uh, I expect Ruben to be available. So we'll see. Uh, but you know, you get a guy like Jay Sean and then obviously Jeremy Spragans, uh, Fanage Gote, um, you know, th- those guys have kind of been able to pick up the slack and Amon McCullough. Uh, he's he's doing a good job this year. Don't yeah. worry, Ahmed. I knocked on the wood for you. I mean, you should I was find wondering, some still. But I was um, wondering what happened. You turned into like an orangutan for a minute. Your arms started going in the air. I was like, what trying is to find wood to knock on. We've avoided the season-ending injuries. Wood, a wood, 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 wood. I, I said, I said so far. I said so far. But, yeah, wood, wood, yeah. wood, wood. All right. <laughs> Well, we we mentioned uh, the Connor Bazlack, their uh, junior QB, number nine. This is not going to be the same quarterback we saw last week. This is not a accurate quarterback. He's looking at a 52.5 completion percentage, nine TDs, six interceptions. And again, like so, you mentioned, the 19 sacks. If we dominate this game, this is where we need to dominate this game. Get this guy that, off his spot. To that point, and I wanted to get your guys' take on this, just based off what you've seen and, and what you've heard about this quarterback – is it that he's not a very accurate thrower, or is it the fact that he's running for his life every time he gets the ball? Yeah. Does it matter as long as they're still true? <laughs> well, well kind of our defensive front's got to continue to get that pressure. That's true. Yeah, and I think Mokite is a guy that um, I think I mean, if you know deserves some credit as well, but Mokite's done a good job kind of generating some pressure. Shibuzi's done a good job as well. So I think – Booker. Uh, Kind of Kurt, yeah. He he said he said I think he, last weekend or two weeks ago he had a he had a good he game. flashed, yeah. yeah, yeah, he did. Um, so I think you know the the you know being able to to kind of force him out to the pocket, I think that's a big thing. But um, you know he's a good quarterback. Like even out of high school, he was uh, he could make the throws, and I believe he was an elite eleven quarterback. If memory serves correct. Um, so I mean he 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 is good, but he's not like like I think Talia is uh, undoubtedly a better quarterback than he is. Oh, he's okay. going to be throwing down. We got, he's got number six junior wide receiver, Cam Camper, 6'2", 202. So he's definitely got some size on him. Uh, he's gotten 35 for 457 and one this year. So that would be your number one threat in the air uh, for that passing attack. Yeah, and their tight end doesn't look as daunting. I mean, this guy on the year, 13 catches for 121 yards and a touchdown. Pretty sure the uh, Purdue tight end outplayed him in one game. Uh, hopefully he doesn't end up being a factor, but... Uh, yeah, like I said, I think systematically, uh, defensively, we need to make some adjustments. Uh, you know, when they when teams attack you constantly in the flats, which has happened multiple times this year, we have not been able to adjust, and that's that tape is out there, right? So if Indiana sees any opportunity for us, that's where it's going to be. It's going to be in the soft spots in the zone. It's going to be out of the flats. Uh, hopefully, we can adjust and, and protect against that because that can ultimately determine whether this game is close or whether it's an absolute blowout. Because I think this game could go either way. Maryland could walk in there and absolutely blow them off, blow the doors off the place if they go in there with the right game plan, or if they continue to let teams just easily drive the ball down the field with those types of throws, then Indiana can hang around. 
The strange thing is, Michigan State, we did adjust the flats. Like, we were going to lose that game if we didn't. We slowed that down a lot. It was just last game where at the first quarter, they were they were adjusting the flats, and you were, were worried about it. I looked at it and was like, last week we fixed it. Hopefully we fix it. We, we didn't really fix it. Mm-hmm. It wasn't quite as big in the second half. It was more the tight end in the middle finding a soft part of the zone and maybe that's just what the difference was is that they found an answer to our answer that every time we covered the flat the tight end found the center of the zone that was open i mean there's they can make adjustments too so but it, we it, we did not seem to have that just you know all right we got this now now what are you going to do that that didn't happen last week all right yeah. let's 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 get into predictions ahmed tell me how this game shakes out i'm assuming you're going with the terps to win how do they get there I'm going 31-16. Um, I think Maryland has defensively. Um, I'd really say probably. Uh, I'll I'll give a little bit of credit in SMU. I thought you know there were a lot that you know a lot that went wrong, but I, I think the week before that, after Maryland's uh, the the Charlotte scored their first two touchdowns, I thought the defense looked good. Um, SMU, you know, obviously there was you know SMU was able to generate almost 500 yards of offense, but kind of since then they've really done a good job in my eyes. Um, I think as long as Maryland's able to stop that uh, wide receiver, Cam Camper, he's doing a good job. He's obviously like the go-to target uh, for Connor Bazelic. Um, so I think Maryland has the firepower to do so. Um, and then Maryland's offense versus Indiana's defense, I think, is just kind of an overpower. Um, so I think Maryland's going to win this handily, uh, you know, be able to maintain that double-digit lead going into the third quarter, fourth quarter. Um, so I, I, I do expect and I feel a lot more confident that Maryland comes out in this one with a win than they did uh, last week going into Purdue. Ryan, how do you see it shaking out? Well, I'm going to go full-blown homer here, man. I mean, if Vegas is going to give me 11 points, i got to give me more than that. Uh, 38-21. 38-21 Terps. All right, and how do you see them doing that? 38 points, a lot of points. you think it's a balanced offensive attack? Do you think they do it through the air, on the ground? What do they do? I I think we're going to get back balanced. I think we're going to be able to pick them apart with these 10 to 15-yard passes that he has shown in the last two weeks that he is – you know, working at an expert level um, and get Antoine Littleton back involved again. There was not enough Littleton for me. I love Hemby. He's great. I love having him on the backfield. He picks up blocks well, but Littleton is just different. People see Hemby before. Like, there are lots of Hembys in the Big Ten. Mm. There's no other Littletons. Not lots. Okay, that's that's an over-exaggeration. Yeah, definitely There's a couple Hembys in the Big Ten. That type of running back exists. Nobody else looks like Littleton. You have to give this man carries. He minimum of 10 carries a game for Littleton. I don't understand. <laughs> Hand him the ball. <laughs> All right. I like it. Uh, I do think they get, like you said, more back to a balanced offense uh, in this game. I think this is a coming out party for Dante Demas that we've all been waiting for. Right? Because Holy God, would that be great. I, I do. <laughs> and, and the reason I say that is because when you think, you think back to the injury and – the timetable of when we thought Demas would be back. You know, we said it would probably be back by the start of Big Ten play, right? And he ended up coming back a lot earlier than we thought. He ended up starting the season. Uh, But I figured it would take him a few weeks to kind of get his feet underneath of him, to really feel confident in the leg. Um, And and I think... He needs to, to to have a game where he puts it all together and trusts everything and just goes out there and gets back to being Dante. And I think against a, a vulnerable defense like this, uh, and, and maybe the offensive game plan is to kind of boost his confidence going into the latter half of the season, I think now is the opportunity to do that, and you, you're going to get plenty of targets out of him. Uh, so I think this is a game for Dante to have a game. I think he has two touchdowns in this game. I'm going to go over 100 yards and two touchdowns. Dante with a big day. I think the uh, Terps win at 34-24. I'm about to do a cartwheel if that happens. <laughs> <laughs> Call the ambulance because Fat Boy's doing a cartwheel. <laughs> yeah. I, I think I think it would be great, you know, to be able to see Dante be able to do that. And, and I think you kind of saw a little bit more out of Dante last week. Um, I, I just mm-hmm. remember when it was that week two when that that lead interception and on uh, that final minute of the second quarter. I think that was kind of the play. But then it hit me. I was like, okay, it's clear that the Dante Demas of this year is not the same Dante Demas of last year. And I thought last week was first time where i felt like i saw the tangible um you know mm-hmm. return to form um so i i like the pick wouldn't shock me i was just right before uh, right after ryan went i was thinking to myself uh, 100 yards two touchdowns for rakeem jarrett uh, i just kind of have that feeling that he's gonna have a breakout game but you know dante demas i think it you know um 
that that's the thing about this receiver room. You know, they're all getting it to go off uh, all yeah. at the same time. But for a guy like Demas, you know, to to kind of be able to put all that film together last year and then have you have that type of injury, uh, I think it'd be huge not only for the Maryland's offense but his own draft stock uh, to, yeah. to kind of have that bounce back game. And we're going to need Dante, man, especially when we start getting into the the really tough part of the schedule in the next yep. few weeks here, right? We're going to need that that the old Dante to come back. We're gonna, if we're going to expect State pad, to Ohio win, State. right? If we're going to expect to win any of those games, big Dante is going to have to be a part of it. He might not have to be ten catches and you know 150 yards, Dante, but he needs to have the confidence, and I think that that's been lacking a little bit. And to have a big game like this against Indiana, I think only helps him uh, go into the season so has anybody into seen the season. dante run a nine route yet because i don't i can't come up with it and he like, just doesn't that have that explosive speed that he used to have he can't get by anybody dunking at locks house and doesn't have explosive i just i don't know like <laughs> i just feel like it's different it's, in pads and trusting it on the football field after what happened you know so yeah. it just takes time and that's like i said we thought the the normal trajectory of him getting back would be Big, you know, was opening up Big Ten, and then it would take him a couple of weeks to kind of get his. Well, now we're at that point, right? He's beyond that point, and a couple of weeks into Big Ten, um, I don't know. I just think he's due. Yeah, I mean, there's the, a, the there swami. is a bye week coming up, right? So I mean, if, speak if it, it into existence. I hope so. If it doesn't happen the week after the bye week, I'm going to give up hope. But uh, <laughs> I, I, I hope it. I hope you're right this week. But I'm going to hold out hope that maybe we get you know 80 90 percent of dante back until that week after the bye week where he, if he proves me wrong i'll just we got to look elsewhere <laughs> yeah yeah and, and the only reason you mentioned mentioned the bye week uh, just thinking about it going into this weekend i thought the schedule just worked out perfectly for maryland obviously you know had a chance to get to five and one obviously four and two is really nothing to, to get too disappointed about but to have two winnable games going into a bye week and then uh have at wisconsin at penn state home against ohio state um, I, I again, I, I just think Maryland's kind of at that point. You know, uh, Glenn Miller is a guy that he's been out a couple weeks, and I think uh, Gavin Gibson, like, I'm not expecting him to play this weekend. So, uh, you get two weeks, two winnable games. Um, uh, if Maryland does what they need to do, uh, and then you get back some of these key players to, to kind of replenish your depth a little bit, um, uh, I, I just think that you know, this, this kind of sets up well for Maryland so far this year. Yeah, we still have an opportunity to be bowl eligible in the next two weeks. Like, yeah. that's a realistic yeah. thought process. So, yeah. if you get that done, all will be forgiven. We will have the at the end of the year what if moments of just a couple plays. But that's great if we can get to, you know, six in at after these two games. That probably means you end up with at least seven by the end of the year regular season wins that's one more regular season win than last year and so far we have no blowouts which was another one of our goals for the for the season so if we continue that trend even if you only win seven if you do not get blown out there is the progress we looked for that that's, is a successful season as long as a bowl is won after that that's a great point there have not been any embarrassing losses there have been a lot of hurt or not a lot a couple of hurtful losses a couple of hurt losses feelings that, there's been hurt yeah, feelings we, yeah hurt feelings a <laughs> couple of games that we thought maybe we could have won the way that they shook out but it is what it is uh yeah. so eight still on the table we, yeah. we just lost our opportunity at nine most likely unless we just catch fire but eight is still on the table, regular season yeah. wins, and that is a great season. So yeah. it's way better than 90% of fans thought before the season started. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. All right, so any updates, Ahmed, on the recruiting side of things? I heard in the uh, through the grapevine, I think on Twitter maybe, that we got a commit from a kicker and a well-known kicker. Yeah, uh, Roman Levant uh, from uh, IMG Academy, a uh, four-and-a-half star kicker on uh cole's kicking which is kind of man they're giving yeah. half stars now that's bs yeah, stars, stars are so i hate that star ratings halves. even more now they're doing <laughs> half what the fuck? Yeah, they're the, just uh, so accurate they need to be able to like decimal this oh god <laughs> the uh cole, cole's kicking that's kind of the the um trusted source for Standard, specialists yeah. like long snappers kickers punters whatnot uh so it looks like he did well i believe he visited a couple weeks ago uh comes in as a walk-on i uh, mentioned that on the site um so obviously you know, you, you lose a guy like Chad Ryland. Obviously, you have a guy like uh, Harrison Beatty, Jack Howes uh, in the, uh, on the roster. And I think Jack Howes is going to be the guy that uh, he'll most likely uh, take over next year, um, uh, if, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, obviously, you, you need to, to kind of repl replenish that roster spot. So, um, yeah, uh, good, good ad by Maryland there. For sure, for sure. Now, on the basketball side of things, we haven't really talked much basketball since football started. And obviously, the basketball practices and stuff like that are just starting to kind of get underway. 
Uh, Kevin Willard obviously done big things in the recruiting trail already. Has he done anything lately or any names that are on the radar of things that uh, could be popping up soon? Yeah. Uh, before you mentioned that, uh, just, I believe, uh, first practice was, uh, two weeks ago that Friday, uh, that was practice. So they've kind of been in the swing of things now. Um, and I've just kind of heard that, you know, a lot of the players, uh, been very proactive, just kind of working outside, getting more shots up outside of practice. Um, so it sounds like, good. you know, they're going to be another opportunity for, some Terrapin Club members to be able to check out practice this weekend. So that'll be kind of interesting, a uh, different, uh, different perspective for, for fans to be able to kind of see that or um, paying fans to be able to see that. I should clarify, uh, but on their, <laughs> on the recruiting side, uh, five-star uh, power forward down, down from uh, Montverde Academy, Baltimore native, uh, Derek Queen. Uh, he's going to be taking his official visit next weekend. I uh, just got a chance to talk to his mom a couple hours ago. Uh, they're coming off the official visit to Indiana a couple weeks ago. Uh, Kansas jumped in uh, with an offer this week, but uh, as of now, Maryland's the next and only official visit scheduled. So uh, obviously a massive, massive target uh, now that staff yeah. kind of able to reach out to 2024 targets. They're pretty much recruiting him just as hard uh, if not harder than three targets right now so um would be a huge coup uh, like i told you guys off air before this show i got a chance to watch him uh when he was at st francis academy when he played with julian reese and i mean even as a freshman you could just tell that Derek queen was just uh he was just a special talent uh, just his way he's just so um he's so smooth with his ball handling uh, around the rim and it gets to the rim so effortlessly he does a good job rebounding. Um, he's not the most athletic and I think that's kind of the mo the, the biggest neck against him. Uh, but I think he's very efficient and has the ability to kind of shoot from outside. So um, he's an obvious elite difference maker uh, for Maryland and uh, they're recruiting him as such. Um, and then elsewhere in the 2023 class, uh, a couple hours before we recorded four star forward, Mohamed Diabute, uh, he will make his commitment on Sunday between Maryland and Virginia tech, Alabama, and Wake Forest. I uh, don't have a strong pulse on that one yet, but he visited back on, uh, September 16th for an official visit to Maryland. Uh, he's fresh off an official visit to Alabama. Uh, also officially visited, uh, obviously, uh, Virginia tech and wake forest. Uh, Kansas state was another school that was originally in his top five. They ultimately did not receive an official. Um, so we shall see how it shakes out. Obviously you have three guards and Deshaun Harris, Smith, Jamie Kaiser, uh, Jonathan Lamoth, uh, all committed in the 2023 class so far to give, uh, Kevin Willard a top 25 consensus class right now. Uh, um, but uh, so obviously all the attention is kind of shifting into that front court and Queen, you know, mentioned a couple weeks ago, he's obviously a possibility to, to reclassify in the 2023 class. So that's kind of why um, he, he's such a, a prominent target. But uh, Debo a guy that, that he can uh, play the four. So um, he's been a guy that Graham Bill Meyer has been recruiting months now. Kevin Willard has been able to spend a little bit. So uh, time will tell, but he's been a guy that Maryland's been recruiting for a long, long time. Um, and then uh, four star center, uh, Papa Conte should be announcing uh, in the ne these next couple weeks. Uh, Maryland got a chance to host him on another visit uh, a couple weeks back after he officially visited, I believe, July 20th. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, not not as many targets as football, obviously, but, uh, you know, should be some developments on the front court side of things for Willard and company. So we'll see how they can uh, maintain their momentum. Is uh, Diabati a, a local? Uh, Mohamed Diabalte? No, he's uh, from uh, Putnam Science up in uh, New York. Okay, all right. Just okay. wanted to make sure it wasn't, uh, didn't need to read between the lines with uh, Kevin Willard's hey. comments of you can't keep everyone home. <laughs> to oh. See if maybe we were just common uh, fans no. down for this weekend. <laughs> no, and I, and I think that's fair, though. I mean, I think that's just. Oh, it's you know, completely him. fair. <laughs> yeah, especially, especially on the basketball side. It's different than, than football uh, where you got to recruit in mass. Uh, so, so I get it. I get what he was saying. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I will say, um, I remember, you know, only cause you mentioned just kind of shift away from recruiting a little bit. Um, you mentioned just, you know, seeing Willard, uh, uh the big 10 media days, but one thing that you heard, you know, just kind of before, you know, he, he kind of took over the job was that he's very reserved and then it takes a little bit for him to warm up. But, you know, a couple of times that I met him just, you know, functions or you see him out where he's speaking, he's a lot more natural, but, uh, definitely felt a little bit tense yesterday at big 10 media days. It was, uh, what about a 10, 15 second introduction right, right into questions. And I think that segment was only lasted about four or five minutes. So, uh, I thought that was, uh, thought that was an interesting, uh, interesting take from yesterday. Yeah, both him and Brenda kind of got the short stick on, like, short yeah. interviews. It was yeah. uh, very interesting how different. Again, you know, the Big Ten's just not interested in us yet. Even if yeah. we're better than them at women's basketball, clearly, we should definitely talk to all the other teams.
Yeah, there was there was kind of there was kind of this awkward pause for for Brenda. I think she got asked uh, what was the bigger impact, the transfer portal NIL. She's like, oh man, that's a tough one. I just imagine, you know, in like that two three seconds, she just had all those outgoing transfers uh-huh. from the summer just flash through her head. She's like, well, how am I going to get this yeah. out? But, Let's see. Uh, uh, well, yeah. NIL takes from us, and the transporter <laughs> portal giveth. Uh, so it'll <laughs> yeah. depend on our season. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, but yeah, they also had their media day yesterday. So I think the Lady Terps, Abby Myers uh, from from Princeton. I think she's she's going to be obviously Diamond Miller comes back. So I think it's going to be uh, another another intriguing season. I think that they're projected to finish fourth in the Big Ten this year. So uh, should should be a fun one on the lady side as well. That's awesome. That's awesome. And my girls are already asking to go back, so we'll have there to pick a big game and uh, get down there and see the little turtles. There you go. Yeah. So exciting things going on with the basketball program, man. Kevin Willard's off and running, doing big things. Uh, a couple of side notes, basketball related, I did want to bring up real quick. Daryl Morcell, former Terp, uh, signed with the Utah Jazz the other day. So kudos to Daryl Morcell for getting a shot at the NBA. So we'll see how that shakes out for him. Uh, and then former Terp, Legend, Gravis Vasquez, uh, I guess going to be inducted into the Maryland Athletics Hall of Fame. Pretty cool. Yeah. That's, uh, What's that's, your guys' cool. takes on Grav- Gravis? Gravis is, I mean, he's, <clears throat> I know, Ryan, you're a little younger than I am, so he might have been kind of like in your wheelhouse of when you really started following Terps basketball. Like, obviously, I was in the, the Blake and the, you know, even – man, before Blake and before Juan Dixon, but there's nobody as passionate on the floor. There was nobody as passionate as Gravis Vasquez. I mean, we we love Bruno and what he did on the floor and everything, but Gravis Vasquez, what he brought in energy to the to the stadium, right? To the to the arena and yeah. how he got that fan base to just to just explode and interact with him and was second to none. I love Gravis Vasquez. Yeah. Uh so honestly, this is probably my be my fan fanboy moment, but Gravis is like not even close. He's a Maryland player ever. Uh his senior year is my senior year in high school. Uh, got to the point where I literally wrote the number with my basketball shoes. Uh, was like taking all <laughs> the buzzer awesome. beaters and in, in in class and whatnot. Uh, a full a old buddy from high school had a Gravis Vasquez jersey. He didn't want it. Sold it to me for five dollars. So like, yeah, I mean, senior night. Mark what was it March third, two thousand ten, when they beat Duke. I mean, just a whole season. He was just so much fun to watch, and I think just the emotional aspect and his ascension and beating uh, uh, UNC junior year. I mean, there were just so so many uh huge memories um and uh yeah i i had some friends that were duke fans so even when they they won it uh, won the championship in 2010 i just kept saying well well you know who's the last team to beat you and you make them sit in maryland and bring up gravis so uh yeah gravis uh honestly will kind of always hold a special place in my heart honestly See, Fred, that's you tried awesome. to move a generation. Clearly, that's what I, I mean. I love Gravis. I love the attitude of his and how it played off so well with Gary's, you know, like fire, like the whole idea of like, that's what Maryland was, is this kind of aggression and like yeah. over the top behavior. I love that. But yeah, my my true generation of basketball was the national championship. Was it? Okay. I think you you're you clearly were in that as well, but you also had the the Fran Stevie Francis and stuff yeah. that I was barely, you know, knew anything about. Um, you know, these so I think it's kind of you're there and I was the championship and, and uh you know, uh Ahmed's got the Gravis is his like highlight memory. Of course, you know, the national championship is still big for any Maryland fan will remember that one, you know, moment, but He's just one of those uh, guys yeah, that, like, when you say, I wish he could have won a national championship, if you could pick anybody, oh, he it was, was Gravis Vasquez. Yeah, absolutely. Man. Yeah. He's just he, – he was everything to that program. He was the heart and soul. He was the heartbeat of that team. Uh, it's just, you know, unfortunate that he wasn't able to get one. But uh, it's pretty cool that they're recognizing him. And uh, they kind of did it in this uh, – I guess it was like a team's call and Gary Williams led the the call and, and, and caught him by surprise. He had no idea what the call was about. Uh, you could see him get emotional about it and you could see that passion come back into him about how much he loved playing at Maryland. You know, it wasn't, you know, he had a, a pretty long NBA career, but he'll tell you that those four years at college park were the most fun he's ever had playing basketball. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty, pretty cool. cool. So he uh, definitely em- embraces what it, what it is to be a Terp. So uh, I'll, I'll always love it and well-deserved. Absolutely. 
All right, guys. Well, we appreciate you tuning in to us uh, for this week's show. And if you haven't already, make sure you're subscribed to us on YouTube. You can find us at Shell and Tell. You can find all the audio podcasts at your podcast app of choice, Apple, Spotify, Google, wherever you want to find us. We're there. Uh, if you want to follow us on Twitter, you can follow the show at Shell and Tell Pod. You can follow Ryan at Terps B. Espert. Follow me at Fred BLBS. And follow Ahmed at Kafir the Turtle. And don't forget to follow Inside Black and Gold. Ryan. Sign us off. Guys, another big week. You know, we had to bounce back from a loss once. Can we do it again? We need to get back on track. Cannot let another one slip. Let's hit the road. Do our job. Get behind your boys. And please don't let that be the one game that I'm excited that new fans are hitting the stadium. Get your people out there. Put out one more time and cap off this season. Until next time, here's the wishing. All is well under the shell.